Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where we bring evidence, experience, and perspective to make sense of today's leading health challenges. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. This is Lindsay Smith-Rogers. Today, a conversation with Dr. Antonia Novello, who served as the 14th Surgeon General of the United States, appointed by President George H.W. Bush in 1989. Dr. Novello was the first female and first Hispanic Surgeon General in U.S. history. She speaks with Dr. Josh Sharfstein about her remarkable life and career, from her childhood in Puerto Rico to her time studying public health at Johns Hopkins to her pioneering service to the nation. She also talks about her new autobiography, which is chock full of amazing stories. Let's listen. Dr. Antonia Novello, it is an honor to have you on Public Health On Call. I just finished reading your book, which is called Duty Calls, Lessons Learned from an Unexpected Life of Service. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing fine. We are just at the library of President Bush with a tour of the book, and it has been a very successful one. Well, we will be talking about President Bush, who appointed you to be Surgeon General at in this conversation, but I want to start a little bit earlier. You grew up in Puerto Rico. Could you talk about your life there in the book? You talk a lot about how you had some illnesses that really focused you on your studies and on medicine. Yeah, I was born with Hirschsprung's disease, which is basically a genetic aganglionic megacolum. And so basically from the age of my birth to my 18th birthday, I had one of the parts of the syndrome, which was constipation, because, you know, it can be accompanied by mongolism, deafness, cardiac disease, spina bifida. And it seems to me that if God only gave me constipation, I figured that I was meant to do something with my life. And so that's why it was very important for me to tell the public that if I went 18 years of my life with all these complications and then surgical fixation at the end was worse than the constipation. So three more years until finally the Mayo Clinic was able to take care of me and put me whole again. How did that affect your interest in medicine or your education? Well, it seems to me that I am one of those cases that fell through the cracks of healthcare and that the only place that I could have my surgery was in the only place where the insurance that my mother had was able to pay for it. And so the cardiac surgeon was the one who did my operation from the GI tract and that kind of tells you Learn to have a second opinion, but at that time I was so happy that somebody was taking care of me because my bellies were becoming so big that this lady assumed that I was pregnant and that was very painful for me. Your mother, you mentioned, plays a really important role in your life and in this story. Yes, mommy was empathetic, but not sympathetic. Otherwise, I don't think I would have gotten this far. I would never get a break feeling sorry for myself. On the contrary, she almost always told me, education is the way out and I'm going to get you out of here. And so even at times when you were not allowed to even leave the island, mommy made sure that I left and finished my studies outside of Puerto Rico. It should take courage because now, you know, most of the 44% of Latino students are basically first generation, but about 62% of them are just working in two years institutions because parents want to keep them close. And so I feel very good that mommy just gave me wings for me to do something beyond, beyond Puerto Rico. So you went to the University of Puerto Rico for medical school. Yes, I did. And then you came to the United States for your clinical training in pediatrics. What was that transition like for you? Well, let's say that I wanted to watch the snow coming down and not go to work because I had never seen it before. And Michigan only has two weeks of summer. So it was quite an interesting change. And so... It was really interesting because the university got together every single intern from every single state. And I was the only one from Puerto Rico. And only when I was able to have a dinner being Surgeon General is when I realized that the chairman of pediatrics said publicly in that dinner, he knew no one, that he was 
prejudice about getting me into the University of Michigan because he thought that only true American students should participate. And what a fool he would have been. And Michigan would have never had their own Surgeon General if his prejudice would have gotten to him rather than my CV. But I never heard about that until I finished my training. Well, what is remarkable reading the book is how you powered yourself through so many struggles and challenges, like a train coming down the mountain, pushing away the obstacles. Well, it's maybe because of the disease that I had, and I always had to hide so much of that. I didn't become a victim of my own problems. And more than anything, I wanted to be a jester. I made it all like funny. So people don't make, don't pay attention to the one who laughs, pay attention to the one who complains. And so I had friends always like in a cocoon protecting me. So I always says people really tell me what to do. And I always do what I think I should do. And because sometimes I have the feeling that maybe they didn't want me to get to the top. And maybe because mommy was the principal of the school, it was assumed that I was getting my grades because of her input, not because of my knowledge. And there were times when I was dubious of that in particular, because when I entered high school, I realized my group was very small and it was not the ones I was accustomed to by junior. So I realized that mommy perhaps afraid as well that I might have just been getting things because the teachers were protecting me, put me in a class in where I would feel like the most intelligent. And so I went to the principal and I said, mommy said, you can change me from the group. She never knew I did that. And he did. And then I was back with my group and then I was back competitive, but it was really interesting. So I, I never stayed behind trying to be better because the other ones were weaker. I wanted to be challenged. And you excelled, you were the Pediatric intern of the year, I remember reading as a pediatrician myself. I appreciate that. And then after your training in Michigan, you moved to Washington, D.C. Is that right? Yes. I became a pediatric nephrologist because my favorite aunt developed chronic glomerular nephritis secondary to hypertension. And so I promised myself no one in my family would ever suffer anything of which I could not help. But Michigan was not doing transplantation for children because the chief of nephrology felt that dialysis was enough for the times. And the same was happening even in New Orleans, where the book about dialysis and children was written. So I went to Georgetown, and Georgetown did the very first transplantation when I was there as a fellow. So it made a difference. Then children started getting transplanted at Georgetown. So I felt very good about at least that little part of my life. Well, you have tremendous clinical training, and you went from there to the National Institutes of Health. Tell me about your time there. Bethesda was trying to look for a nephrologist. The Berry Plan took all the fellows that were at the University of Michigan in 1971-72. So I ended up doing a combined pediatric and adult nephrology fellowship. So Bethesda said, I'm looking for a nephrologist. And I thought, I've been married a Navy flight surgeon. I said, I owe something to the system. So I went for the interview. And it was the only time in where I felt prejudiced against the captain that was interviewing me proceeded to put his feet on the desk, read the Washington Post and never looked at me. And then when I didn't know what to do with my life, he just moved the paper away and says, did you hear? We're looking for a few good men. And so I feel like this is not the place for me. So I was so incensed. His secretary said, if you really want to be in the Navy, join the bureau. Don't come to this person. She called him a jerk. Don't come to this person. So I crossed the street of Bethesda Naval, went to the NIH, which is across the street, and I joined the public health service on that particular day. So I give acknowledgments to this captain in my book, thanking him for having not interviewed me, because otherwise I would have been a three-year career at the Navy rather than a full-time career at the NIH, eventually becoming the deputy director of the Child Health Institute. Well, and what a career you had in the public health service, because you were there when you got the call to become the Surgeon General. Tell me about that. People always say it's not who you are, but who you know. And somewhere along the way, maybe all the planets get together and Dr. Sullivan, who became the Secretary of Health, was a member of the Cancer Board. So I saw him every time I went there to introduce something of pediatrics. And then Dr. Mason was the Assistant Secretary of Health, but he had been previously the CDC Director. And so when AIDS became something in the children, I was given the responsibility of being the chair of the task force that declared that AIDS in children was the fifth cause of death. And so in their eyes, I was forever there. And I have the feeling when they tried to do the job for nine months, they realized that you cannot have the words and the budget and not do the work. So they decided to look for a surgeon general. And having been in their presence for nine months, I have the feeling that they came straight to me because Dr. Coop was 
the God of public health, who can substitute for this guy. So they changed the whole thing by coming for a woman and a Latino. And I would always appreciate that because quite a shoulder weight on myself of trying to emulate Dr. Coop without being him. And I think for the times it was okay because Dr. Coop took care of discovering AIDS. And during my time, it was the AIDS treatment and the quilt. So sensitivity of the part of the women became very important, not just talking about the disease. So interesting. I want to talk about your time as Surgeon General, but first I want to ask you what it meant to you to be Surgeon General, given the incredible obstacles that you had overcome. Frightening. Frightening. Frightening, frightening. I was following Dr. Coop. I didn't even know how to start, so I put it like a pediatric thing. I said, you know, I am in a job in where I'm basically crawling. Give me time so I can start standing and then running. And that's probably how I saw myself on those three and a half years. And so somewhere on the way, they told me, you have to have an agenda because the budget of the office is only $1 million and it covers everything, publications, salaries, personnel, furniture, you name it. And so I decided that if I was able to just not have an agenda, that meant that every institute would send me a person to work with me, but their agenda became then mine instead of me. So I did make sure that I had an agenda. And of course, women's health, vaccinations, underage drinking, tobacco, which I couldn't get away from it, and basically domestic violence. So I put that right in the forefront and work at it for the next three and a half years. Yeah, I was reading about your engagement with tobacco. In the book, you say that the tobacco industry was happy that you hadn't said that much about tobacco at the time of your appointment. I read the memo. It says, get her. She has never spoken about us. And I feel now, remember old Joe? I took old Joe. And it was really interesting too that I never thought of a political work because in, in the NIH, you do your job scientifically minded and make sure it's perfect. I never knew there were politics and I never understood them. But with old Joe, I did because as I was going to march down Michigan Avenue with the Surgeon General of the Army, Navy and Air Force against old Joe, I got a call from the White House. You're not supposed to mention the word old Joe. I said, you got to be kidding. And just to be clear for all our listeners, we're talking about old Joe Camel. Old Joe Camel, which was utilizing his image to be able to lure kids and everything was to lure kids, uh, the Frisbees, the T-shirts and all the stuff that comes with that. And that's when we decided you increase the price of tobacco by 10 percent, then the children's consumption drops accordingly. So we worked very hard at that. So I would walk around saying, all oh, Joe, take a hike. And for some reason, I could not talk about him when the most important moment of declaring him a non grata persona as we marched down Michigan Avenue with the AMA. I was told not to mention it. So I remember joking, I said, can I point? And they may be assuming I was crazy at the White House, but I had a, a picture of old Joe with me marching down the road. And every time I people would wave, I go. <laughs> you'd point at the picture and you'd do thumbs down. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it was going to take a little bit more than that to stop you, it sounds like. Yes, and old Joe doesn't exist. He did it, did the job, and he basically was taken out of at least luring the children. Right. Well, those cartoons, as you point out in the book, were ubiquitous and kids could recognize them uh, like they could recognize Mickey Mouse. Yes. So let me ask you about public health, because you are an alumna of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. What made you come to get public health training? You obviously had tremendous clinical training. Well, I was an executive secretary of the National Institutes of Health at that time. And you have 30 days to write the summary statement for people to get a grant at the institutions and universities. Most of the people in there will take the 30 days. I did them on the weekend. So I had three weeks of what do I do with myself? Obviously, all my peers decided you're making us look bad because you're finishing too fast. But I just, it's avid. And I was about to be 40 years old. And I said, you know, I have to be somebody and I have to do something with my life. So what can I do? Because all I wanted to be was a dean. So I published so many papers in that particular year. And I said, I'm going to do a master's in public health. The public health service did not pay for it. So I paid for it myself. And then Baltimore is so close to the NIH that basically for me, it became a reality. So I would Myself and my students, we were very tight. So what we did is I would go Monday, Wednesday, and Friday one week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Saturday the other one. And when it was lacking, I would take it on Saturday morning in the Hopkins office in Washington, D.C. So that's how I finished my particular 
MPH. And then I saw a class that drove me in love and that was government and public health. And I thought for the first time I understood the power of government and the control of health. And I said, I'm going to know much more about that. So from that time, I went and joined then the public health assignee to the labor and education, health and education, where Senator Hatch was the director at that time, previously had been Senator Kennedy. Right. Well, let me just say, as someone who now teaches the introduction to public health policy, I loved reading this story about how you fell in love with government and policy in public health school. I did. And you went right to work on Capitol Hill. Uh, you know, an important moment where there was a lot of policy. And would it be fair to say that that was a training program in its own right for you? Absolutely. And more than anything, it teaches you leave your ego at the door. It teaches you how to write a memo that somebody would read it and at least act upon. Not too windy, long. What's the purpose? How many people will benefit? What is the amount of money that will be spent? And how many people will benefit? And then little, how much press are we going to get for this? And so I learned how to write memos and I learned how to write little speeches for the senator. And it taught me many, many things in government. But ego at the door is very little that we have taught ourselves in medicine to do that. But it did that. And then my career in public health basically is because it gives you anonymity. I want to make sure that you do things for the world that they will never know you existed. Your reputation is very hard to leave out all those years without having say me, myself and I, but it gives you the ability to work for many people and for them not to even know you existed, but you feel good about the successes of what you did. And the two things during that time was the labels of cigarette and the other one was the Organ Procurement Transplantation Act because we were having transplant surgeons doing surgery in people that could pay $9,000 for a kidney, but would skip somebody else off the list that waited their turn. Well, I used to work for Congressman Henry Waxman, who did a lot of work with Senator Hatch, as you know. Yes, I remember. They together created the generic drug industry. And I agree with you completely that when you're an aide on Capitol Hill, nobody knows your name in the outside world. And you're really working to try to get something right to happen. And it is an incredible kind of training program. And you obviously put that training to tremendous use. Now, your book is not just a list of the high points in your career. There are all kinds of stories. It is such a great read. I just want to say that I enjoyed it from cover to cover. There are two stories about pants I want to ask you about. The first one has to do with Senator Hatt, which is there you are as a doctor on the senator's staff, and you had the idea because he had Achilles tendon and you wanted to get him some kind of legging. Is that right? It shows you the competitiveness of the job as an assistant to the senator. We were four people, fellows at that time, and we all competed, but I was the, the one who just came in. And so the senator needed host, support host for his Achilles tendon, and they sent me to get it. And I failed maybe two times. And I said, here goes the fellowship. <laughs> So I thought to myself, I know what I'm going to do. So I went to Georgetown, a real skinny elderly passed me by. And so I said, can I see your legs? <laughs> he looked at me like, this is a freak. So he did. And I said, that's the size that I need for the senator. I said, what size would you use? He says, this one. So I bought them. I took them to the senator to put them on and it worked. And so I look at the guys like, nah, 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 nah. Said, no more could they fool me around. So that was a success story. Yeah, because the first couple hoes were too big and they fell down to his ankles. They would fall down right in my presence after I had gone twice to Georgetown. <laughs> but this one was a success. The second story that has to do with pants were when you had to wear pants at Surgeon General because you spilled... Nail polish. Yes. A whole bottle of red nail polish on the front of my summer uniform, which was white. At a press conference in one hour, I am a woman, so I'm doing my nails. And all of a sudden, the whole bottle of red nail polish falls in front of my uniform. I thought, oh my goodness, I don't even have an hour in martinizing to get this done. What am I going to do? And I cannot cancel the press conference. So I went to Dr. Mason, very, very conservative Mormon person. And I say, sir, can I use your pants? <laughs> <laughs> he looked at me like I was from Venus, <laughs> almost like disrespectful. And I was covering my front. When I took out my hands from my front, he thought I had a hemorrhage of some sort. <laughs> <laughs> Just go over there and get my pants. So 
I go in there and the first time that I really noticed that men's pants in the public health looked like they had boxers. No, it's just the way the pants were made. So I wore his pants. They fit, but they were about two feet hanging down this way. So I put them under my shoe, went under my desk and gave the speech of my life for the press conference. And from there on, every time I wanted something from him, I say, Dr. Mason, remember, I wore the pants in this place. So we had kind of a collegiality because of the pants episode. <laughs> That is really quite a story, and the media never figured it out. I never stood up from there until they were gone. So I want to end by asking you about an event that happened at the School of Public Health. I think this was after you were Surgeon General, but you came to the school and asked to organize an event for all living surgeons general at the time, which would have included the Everett Koop, as you mentioned, who did so much on AIDS. It included Julius Richmond, I believe. And including the Eisenhower, he's as a lecturer on his behalf, and the Lyndon B. Johnson one. I was in awe that I was meeting all these people. And so I tell Dean Sumner, Dean, do you mind if I do like and invite the surgeon generals to come here? Because at that time, remember, we were looking for the, the health of the year 2000, the health of the year 1990. So I said, why don't we say the health of the future? How do we handle health in the United States? And then let's do it here. He said, Amuse him. He said, sure, like, go ahead. And I remember first I said, if I get Dr. Coop, I get this. So I called Dr. Coop. I said, Dr. Coop, I am planning to have the surgeon generals come to Hopkins and I wanted you to participate. And he says, well, Tony, I only have the first of April open in the next year. Oh, boy, coincidence. That's the day that I was planning to. (laughs) Then I called all the others. Dr. Coop is coming. But I had problems with two. One of them had a little hard hearing. So I had to scream on that phone beyond belief and everybody knew I was trying to get him. Finally, the wife came and I was able to get this done. And the other one, he couldn't come because practice for the choir. I said, oh my God. So I called the wife, got him to come too. And all of them came. Hopkins closed for that day, put the kids to be there for as much as they wanted to. They went in lines as we, the surgeon generals passed and they were just so happy. They asked all the questions that they wanted. Then I said to the Dean Sumner, Dean, I'm going to get somebody to be the public affairs director of the School of Government at Harvard. He was like, this woman is going driving me crazy. Tony, what else are you doing? I said, and by the way, Janet Reno will close the meeting. Is that okay with you? He went like, what else? <laughs> At the terrific day, questions were answered. The kids were either in monitors or, or right there or in standing in the, in the amphitheater. And then I realized that that picture was used for the Christmas card of Hopkins of that year. And then also for the School of Development. But the important thing is that then, now Dharma's last year, try to imitate that same technique, making sure that they used it for the inauguration of the new president, who happens to be a psychology. And she wanted to do something unique. So I invited the surviving surgeon generals, which are seven, and we just cover mental health. Well, I can tell you that people at the School of Public Health remember that event. It was quite an epic event. And I spoke to Dean Sommer this morning, and he said, tell her how great that event was. You know, you were right. The attorney general, Janet Reno, closed the event. It was incredibly memorable. He gave us a medal. He gave us the medal of the dean to all of us. And of course, the president of Dharma's gave us the Dharma's president's medal. It was like a tiny, teeny, teeny competition, but nothing like the one that it happened. Because every surgeon general spoke of the needs of health for the future of the United States. And Dr. Satcher was an incoming surgeon general at that particular time, that then he became the assistant secretary of health, the director of the CDC. So it really put us that from surgeon general, you could be more than just the voice of the president and the country. You can be an agency head of tremendous magnitude. Yeah, and Dr. David Satcher went on to a tremendous career as a Surgeon General. Yes, he did. Let me just say, I wish I could just keep talking to you. I wish we didn't have a timeline for these podcasts because I could ask you about all these other experiences that you describe in your book. But instead, I'm afraid that all of our listeners are going to have to buy the book to hear the rest of it. (laughs) I think it would be great because some of the experiences that I put to work in my life of public health. I used them when I was the health commissioner of the state of New York during September 11. And I think it really shows that when you're trained well, you can use that knowledge to save lives. And I think the communication skills that you learned from that degree became extremely helpful during my lifetime there. 
Well, it is an incredible story in New York, in Puerto Rico, in Michigan, in Washington, in all the different elements of your absolutely remarkable career. Thank you so much. The book is called Duty Calls, Lessons Learned from an Unexpected Life of Service. Thank you for joining me on Public Health on Call. Thank you for having me here, Josh. Public Health on Call is a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Grace Ciceri. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Spencer Greer, Matthew Martin, and Philip Porter, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace Ciceri and Eliza Rosen. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Thank you for listening.